Today, I want to talk to you about one of the attributes and contributions that leaders give other people, and that's what makes leadership so important. I would like to talk to you about the fact that leaders lift others. In other words, wherever you see a leader, the people around that leader will always go to higher ground. My friend Johnny Cash, in our time of mentoring and just talking together, constantly brings up to me in my mentoring time with him, John, I have a great desire to help other people, and I want to make their lives better for them. And he works really hard at that. And it's one of the things I greatly appreciate about him. Every time I look into his heart, his heart is to lift up other leaders. Now, we've heard the expression that it's lonely at the top. But I've always said that a good leader never says that because think about it for a moment. If you're at the top all by yourself, you didn't lift anybody. You didn't bring anybody to the top with you. In fact, if you're only at the top by yourself, you're really not a leader. Honestly, you're, you're just a hiker. Leaders lift other people. Recently, I was doing a lesson on fulfillment because there are so many people, instead of living a fulfilling life, they lead and live an empty life. And I was trying to distinguish the difference between what is emptiness in a person's life and what makes them feel empty and what is fulfilling in a person's life and what brings great joy and fulfillment to them. In that lesson, I was talking about that people that live a fulfilling life, they value people and they add value to those people. Now, that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying lifting others. If you as a leader value people and you add value to people, trust me, my friend, without any doubt, you will lift other people. I have spent my life doing that exact thing. In fact, the other day I had someone come and ask me, tell me, they said a little bit about your journey. How did, how did this happen that you began to be what I would call a leader that lifted other people? Well, honestly, at 75, it's easy for me to understand my life as I look backwards. It was Steve Jobs who's it was Steve Jobs who said, um, "When we look forward, it's hard to connect the dots, but when we look backwards, that then it it just is kind of natural to see how things just fell in place." In my life, back in 1973, I went to a convention in Waterloo, Iowa, and I heard Charles Tremendous Jones, and he said that that I would be the same person I was in five years unless I met new people and I read more books. In other words, Charles Tremendous Jones said to me that the people I associate with and the books that I read are going to determine how successful I will be in life. And from that very moment, I determined that I was going to be around great people and I was going to help people become great. I've often said that when you have a great dream and you have a great team, then all of a sudden you can realize everything that you want to accomplish. Now, I've known those who had a, a big dream and a bad team, and, 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 and that's a nightmare. So how did I lift up people? How do, you, how do you lift up others as leaders? I want to share with you now some material, some, some thoughts that really I've never shared with other people before. This is for you. This is for your training. This is for your growth. This is for your development. This is help to help you to be a leader that lifts up other people. So how do we do this? How do I lift others? How do you lift others? Number one, I think to lift other people, it starts with you. I think you have to have a desire to become great. You have to have a desire inside of you to do great things. I can still remember as a very young leader in my 20s, I came to the conclusion that I wanted to make a difference. I really did. That I wanted to make a difference in my life. I wanted to make a difference in your life. I wanted to make a difference in the people's lives around me. And I had this desire. It was a passion of mine. Napoleon Hill said, the starting point of all achievement 
is desire. I believe that with all of my heart. I have found that great people, great leaders, you don't have to motivate them. You don't have to say, hey, get up, get out of bed, get into the game. They already have that passion. They already have that desire. And I did. And so because I had this great desire, this desire to be great, I went to one of my mentors. His name was Elmer. I call him affectionately E.T. He's still alive. He's older than me. He's 90 years old. But he has been a friend and a mentor for many, many years of my life. And so I'm very, very young. I'm in my 20s. And I go to E.T. and I ask him, how do I become great? What he said to me that day was life-changing. And for, wow, 50 years of my life, I've been following those words. Here's what he said. If you want to become great, go to great events. Seek out great people. Ask great questions. Read great books. Find great mentors. And then he said, above all, attempt to do great things. When E.T. told me that 50 years ago, I marked those words. I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to great events. I'm going to seek out great people. I'm going to ask great questions. I'm going to read great books. I'm going to find great mentors in my life, and I'm going to attempt to do great things. If you want to lift others, the first thing you want to do is just have a desire inside of you to be great. The second characteristic I think that you need to possess is you need to do what my mentor Elmer Towns told me to do as a very young leader. Go to where great people go. Wow. I have discovered that this is the secret to having a a faster pace on my success journey. My mama used to talk to me and say, John, birds of a feather flock together. Average people hang with average people. Uh, People that are successful hang with people that are successful. My father knew that. And as I was growing up, he took time to introduce me to great people. Wow, I I was in the seventh grade when he took me to meet his long-distance mentor himself, Norman Vincent Peel, who wrote the great book, The Power of Positive Thinking. In Columbus, Ohio, seventh grader, I met Norman Vincent Peel. When I was in the 11th grade, I, I met E. Stanley Jones, another great man, a great missionary, a friend of Gandhi's, a man that influenced the world, a great writer. Elmer Towns, my mentor, said and taught me at a young age what he called the hot poker principle. The hot poker principle is just very simple. If you have a fire in the fireplace, if you put the poker in the fire or by the fire, it's only a matter of time till it gets hot. If you remove the poker away from the fire, it's only a matter of time till it gets cold. And Elmer said, John, get around hot people. Get around great people so you can stay hot, so you can stay passionate. That's exactly what I have done. When I was in my late 20s, I wrote a a, a lesson that has been life-changing for many people about how to create a growth environment. In it, I just simply say, listen carefully, a growth environment is a place where others are ahead of you, where you're continually challenged, where your focus is forward, where the atmosphere is affirming, where you're often out of your comfort zone, where you wake up excited, where failure is not your enemy, where others are growing, where people desire change, and where growth is modeled and expected. Those are the 10 things that make a great growth environment. The other day when I was preparing this lesson for you, I was looking at those characteristics of a growth environment, and all of a sudden it hit me. Five of the 10 very essential items to have a growth environment in your life are having great people around you. Others are ahead of you. The atmosphere is affirming. Others are growing. People desire change. Growth is modeled and expected. Five out of the 10 are specifically about great people people. Mark Cole, the CEO of my companies, calls it the power of proximity. 
He talks about the fact that if you really want to do something great, you've got to be around great people because there is a contagiousness that happens when you're around those type of people. And so I've looked at myself and I've asked myself many times, how did I become great? And I'd have to say, without any doubt, I not only had a desire to be great, but I put myself around great people. And again, that's what's so exciting to me about this program, because you're in these lessons, you're going to be exposed to great people who have great ideas and great thinking that can really help you to become great. In my early years, when I was very young, inexperienced, and not known at all as a leader, my mentors were my books. Back then, we didn't have all the incredible technology that you have today. But I was mentored from afar by books or, or by tapes that I could listen to. So, if you really want to lift others up, you have to have a desire to be great, and you have to go where the great people go. Where are the great people? Thirdly, if you really want to be great and be a leader that can lift others, you have to do what great people do. Again, many times we look at great people and we say, wow, I would like to have that title. I'd like to have that position. I'd like to have that money. I'd like to have that influence. And we don't realize that all those things that we want are a result of what great people do every day. The things that we don't even see, the behind the scenes, the hidden disciplines that keep people doing the great things every day so that their greatness shows when they're out in public. A book that I grew up on and was mentored on was Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And when people talk to me about doing what great people do, I say, go to that book. And I would suggest you need, if you haven't, you need to read that book. And if you have read the book, you need to practice the seven habits that Stephen Covey talks about, the things that you have to do to be great. What did he say? He said, number one, be proactive. In other words, take action. There is no success, none, without action. Nobody ever reflected their way to success. Nobody ever thought their way to success. Nobody ever hoped their way to success. No one with good intentions ever had success. It takes action. Action is always associated with success. Be proactive. Number two, begin with the end in mind. This is all about intentionality. This is all about seeing the big picture. This is all about don't do something stupid today that will mess up the long-term journey of your life. Everything that you do, look at your dream, look at your goal, do everything with the end in mind. The third thing that Stephen Covey suggests that we do is to put first things first. In other words, prioritize your life. All leaders know activity is not necessarily accomplishment. I know a lot of busy, hardworking people that are not successful at all. So what we have to do is we have to say, what's the most important? Put first things first. Don't put first things last. Hey, put last things last. Put first things first. Number four, Stephen Covey says, think win-win. I have lived my life following that principle. If I'm going to work with you, I'm going to ask myself a simple question. What is the win for you and what's the win for me? I never get into any relationship where I win and you're going to lose. Or I'm not going to get in a relationship where you're going to win and I'm going to lose. No, I'm going to get into a relationship where together, we both are better. Together, we both win. The fifth thing that 
Stephen Covey talked about that was so effective is he said, seek first to understand, then to be understood. He talked about listening. He talked about caring for people in such a way that you allow them to tell their story and you listen and care and are intentively drawing their story out. In other words, if I understand you well, you'll have a desire because I listen and care to understand me. But I must, again, as a leader, I must go first. So many times leaders, they just want to be understood. They want to make sure that they got their vision out. They got their directions out. And it's kind of like, now listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. But if you really want to lift others and you really want to grow in this area, you don't start with yourself. You start with your people and say, okay, tell me your story. What are your dreams? What is it in your life that you would really like to do that would make a difference in people's life? I love those words. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. The sixth thing that Stephen Covey talks about that is so important for us to, again, be leaders who do what great people do is he said he talks about synergizing. And, and if you really read the chapter, it's really about teamwork. It's, it's about coming together. It's, it's what Mother Teresa said when she said, you can do things I cannot do. I can do things you cannot do, and together we can do great things. Synergizing means that we come together as a team. One is too small of a number to achieve greatness. When we synergize, we, we lead people in a desired uh, vision, but we, we do it together as a team. The last thing that Stephen Covey said is sharpen the saw. In other words, uh, develop yourself personally. He, when he said sharpen the saw, he's talking about cutting down trees. And you all know that if I don't stop long enough to sharpen the saw, if, if it's not the best instrument I can possibly use to cut that lumber, it, it's not going to cut very well. And, and so we have to constantly keep sharp. We have to constantly grow. We have to constantly learn. We have to constantly improve our life. Okay, we're talking about how do we become leaders that lift others? And we've talked about so far three things. We've talked about how important it is for us to have a desire to be great. We have talked about go where great people go and, and then do what great people do. Now I'm going to talk to you about number four, be unforgettable. Be unforgettable. Uh, my friend Jack Welch used to talk about getting out of the people pile. You see, in every organization, there are just a lot of people. So how do you and I distinguish ourselves? I mean, how do we get out of the people pile until they see us and they notice us? And what I want to share with you today is something that's very important, and it's just, it's just life-changing. If you want to get out of the people pile, just commit your life to living a life beyond expectations. I, I want you to I want you to exceed expectations. I want you to set your bar, your personal bar, your your productivity bar, your your life conduct bar. I want you to set it high. You see, only 15% of the people in life even meet expectations. So this people pile, it's just got a whole bunch of people that are just average. And 15% exceed expectations or, or meet expectations. And of those 15% that meet expectations, only 2% exceed expectations. So I want to encourage you in your life to live a life that says, I exceed the expectations of other people around me. In fact, the way I look at it is this. When I'm getting ready to speak for a company, I do a pre-conference call, and one of the questions I ask them is, what are your expectations of me? What do you want to see happen when I come and speak for you? And they tell me, and I write it down. Now, when they give that to me, I look at what I wrote down, 
and those expectations they have of me, that's not my ceiling. That's my floor. I stand on that. I make sure that's going to be done. Now I ask myself the question, how am I going to exceed expectations? How am I going to be so unforgettable that I'm irreplaceable? And they look and they say, I got to have John back because he truly does make a difference in my life. How am I going to do that? Let's re- let's just let's review just for a second. For me to be a leader that can lift other people, I have to have a great desire to be great. I have to go where great people go, do what great people do. I have to be unforgettable, exceed those expectations. And, and number five, I have to be greater on the inside than I am on the outside. Wow, this is huge. You see, when we look at successful people, what we normally do is we see what they have accomplished, the tangible things on the outside. But I am here to tell you that greatness begins on the inside first. My wonderful friend, Truett Cathy, was the founder of Chick-fil-A, this incredible best company to work for in America restaurant chain. When, when, when Chick-fil-A was just kind of starting to get momentum, the people around him said, we need to get bigger, we need to get bigger. And Truett Cathy said, no, no. He said, we need to get better. He said, when we get better, when we improve ourselves, when we get better, the people, the customers, the clients, they'll insist that we get bigger. Our job is to be big on the inside. Our job is to be greater on the inside than we are on the outside. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that I'll be different than most people. For example, many people live a life of scarcity. I live a life of abundance. Most people in relationships with others, they either take the low road or the middle road. They they either kind of, well, if you'll treat me good, I treat you good. You treat me bad, I'll treat you bad. I, I, take, I take the high road. You see, I take the road where if you treat me bad, I'll still treat you good. I will always, um, I will always be bigger in my spirit and my attitude than you. Trust me. I was talking about high road the other day, and a person came up to me at the conference and said, you know, the high road is a toll road but the price is worth it. When they said that to me, I thought how true that is. I am always going to treat people better than they treat me. I'm always going to live a life of abundance, not scarcity. And I'm I'm going to choose sowing over reaping. I'm always going to sow seeds of goodness into people's life. You see, most people, they get up And they look at life from that day and they say, I wonder what life is going to bring to me today. I wonder what it's going to give me. I wonder what I'm going to get out of life. That's how they think. I I never think about reaping. I always think about sowing. In fact, the success of my day is determined by the seeds I sow, not by the harvest. Not by the harvest that I want to reap. So I'm going to constantly do more for others than they do for myself. I'm going to constantly be greater on the inside than I'm on the outside. Now I'm preparing you. All the things I've given you, I'm preparing you to lift other people. So number six, live out your great vision. Now, what I mean by living out your great vision, it's one thing to tell others about your vision, but it's Another thing, to show others your vision. When I tell you my vision, I'm a vision caster. But when I show you my vision, I become a vision character. And when I can show and tell my vision, I become what I call a vision champion. And great people are attracted by great success. So my credibility as a leader isn't what I say I can do, it's what I actually do. So what I do is I bring people with me, the people that I'm mentoring, the people that I'm uh, leading and lifting, 
I, I take them with me. I take them with me to have leadership experiences. I say, come and be with me and, and watch this and, and observe this. This begins absolutely life-changing. When a person sees the vision that you have created, they buy into it so quickly because now they get to be a participant of that vision. Now I get to the very essence of this lesson. If you want to lift others, you've got to develop great people. When people ask me at 75, what is the number one reason for my success? It's very obvious. I have developed great people in my life. And there are two principles for developing great people. And those two principles are, number one, growth requires people development. I have to spend time developing people. Growing organizations grow people. So growing leaders is at the top of my agenda. And personal development, my own personal growth, precedes the development of others. I want to talk to you about serving others. Um, this, this, a leader, a, a great leader serves others. In my 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership book, uh, I talk about the law of addition, and the law of addition is that leaders add value to others by serving them. And I uh, am not a positional leader. I try to be a serving leader, which means um, I don't have people work for me. I have people work with me. I work with people, and, and we just help each other to to grow and to get better ourselves. And I say that because um, when I was a young leader in my 20s, I heard a man named Zig Ziglar one time from the stage say that if you will help people get what they want, then they'll help you get everything that you want and need in your life. And this was a paradigm shift for me because I was a young leader and I wasn't interested in helping people get what they want. I was interested in people helping me get what I want. So I was talking about my vision and get on my leadership train. And it was all about helping me. And that day I walked out of that session. I thought, I'm doing it wrong. Instead of asking people to serve me, I need to serve them. Instead of asking people to add value to me, I need to add value to them. So how am I going to do that? And how am I going to do that successfully? Well, I heard that almost 50 years ago. And now with 45, 50 years of serving other people, let me tell you what serving others has taught me. Number one, it's taught me to value people. It's taught me to change from this idea, you need me, to go to the idea, I need you. You know, today I'm 75, and I'm incredibly grateful for the people that I have around me because what I've learned is this, that the more that I've served them, the more that I value them. And the more that I value them, the more value they bring to me. This is incredible. Once we understand how servant leadership works, it's just like we'll never go back to any other kind of leadership again. So serving others has taught me, number one, to value people. Number two, serving others has taught me to value teamwork. Um, one of us is not as smart as all of us. In my early days, I, um, if I would get an idea, because I was a young leader, I wanted to make sure everybody thought it was my idea so I wouldn't share it with anybody. I would, I would think about it, I'd work about it, I'd develop a system, a plan. And then I wanted to walk in and I wanted to sit down and say, okay, here's, here's, my, uh, here's my incredible plan. And, and so for many years, I, I didn't do shared thinking and I, 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 I didn't value the teamwork. And, and then one day I realized that if I just took my idea to the people, in just a few hours, they would make my idea better. In fact, now I've done this thousands of times over the last you know, th three or four decades. I have never taken an idea to my team that after we talked about it and shared it, every time they've made the idea better. They just have. And so I went, when, I started, when I started really serving people, I, I just began to value teamwork and see the return on teamwork. The third thing was when I started uh, serving people, I, I just became uh, greatly fulfilled. And I, I became greatly fulfilled because um, 
I was going now from success to significance, and I teach often success is about what I accomplish, you know, significance, it's all about you. And the moment that I started valuing people, I found that fulfillment comes in living a significant life. It doesn't come in living a life for myself. And so as I served others, I began to value teamwork. I began to be fulfilled in my life. And so I, I, I sat down after understanding the value of serving others, and I asked myself a simple question. Uh, what questions can I ask myself that would better help and serve you? And so I asked myself questions just, such as, what do the people need? Well, I didn't know what the people needed. So I went to them and I said, I would like to lead you well. I'd like to serve you well. What do you need? And they began to talk to me about what they needed. I literally have written all my books off of the fact that when I was in my late 20s, I came to the conclusion that if I could help people do four things well, if I could really serve them in these four areas, they would be very successful. If I could hurt, help them develop relationships, if I could help them learn how to equip others, if I could help them have a phenomenal attitude in life, and if I could help them to lead. And so I just took those four things and every book I wrote was either relationships, equipping, attitude, leadership. It was again, serving and asking myself, well, you know, what do the people need? And then, you know, once you define what the people need, then you say, okay, now how do I meet that need? What, what do I do? And in the case I just gave you, I started writing books for people. But I, I started asking questions. I started listening. I started developing what I call heart skills, which are, are, are skills that you show people that you truly care for them. And so when I started valuing people and asking these servanthood questions, I, I just began to ask myself, how can I inspire other people to serve other people? And the answer is very simple, by modeling it. So with my team, I constantly serve them. In fact, it's kind of a, a joke because when you watch our team together, we're always looking for ways to serve each other. And you know, it's, it's almost like, who's the king of the servers? Who's, who's the king of the serving hill? I, well, I did this for you, I did that for you. But it's all in fun, but it, it's all because we understand that when I started serving people, I started valuing people, I started valuing what teamwork was all about, and I really started to, to be fulfilled in my life. I think you're gonna find that in your servanthood also. I just wanna encourage you to learn what I have said and practice it this month and serve people and see if it doesn't bring you a, maybe a little bit greater sense of, of fulfillment because you've begun to live this life of, of significance. Hey, welcome back, uh, Chris. Uh, to get you back, we had we had to stay in studio for part two right. just to get you back. So for all of you YouTube uh, viewers, uh, yes, that's the same shirt. Chris stayed for an extra session yeah. today to do part two. I think really what happened was uh, he saw the great content that John had for us today, and he knows that you and I don't stay on time. And so he said, "Well, instead of this being one lesson, we better break it up we into two. So he just cut us. He cut us in half. What I love about um, where John's taken us and even your comments as we opened up today in today's lesson is use the word guide and, and John's used it before too. And yeah. as a leader, that's so much of what we, what we ought to be, yeah. um, not only guiding them professionally, but also personally, we believe in that, but also helping guide them to learn, to be developed, to facilitate conversations and situations. Um, and so this is, again, like Mark said, if you, did not listen to part one. I want to encourage you to, yeah. to do that because there's some really good content uh, in, in points one and two in part one. Today in part three, John John jumps right in and he talks about, and this is so true for all of us. I know even internally as he was, as he was teaching this and you and I were sitting here taking notes, I go, oh yeah, no, I want to be in a safe environment. Especially coming through what we've experienced over the last couple of years, so many people want to be they want to they want to um, be heard, they want to make sure they're seen, they want to be in a safe place for many reasons, but as a leader, we want to be able to create that around content, around what we're facilitating, mm -hmm. around what they're learning, around what we're learning. Um, and I've seen you do this many times, uh, leaders go first. And one of the first things you do when we're learning something new or you're teaching us something new is like, hey, let me let me tell you where I messed this up. Yeah. And this is what I learned from it. And, and you almost kind of just take our walls down. You go, man, okay, so we're gonna leave. We're gonna go after this inside the organization personally, professionally, and it's okay yeah. if we mess up because you went first and you lowered that walls for us. 
Talk a little bit about how you create that environment in our team as a leader of, of teaching, of communicating, facilitating things that are adding value to us, but giving us permission to to experiment, to try to fail. Talk a little bit about that from your leadership lens. Yeah, you know, every podcast, some of you may know this, you've picked up on it by now, we, we kind of put a standout statement before mm. every podcast. And it's just kind of the overarching thesis of what we're trying to drive. And today's is great teachers don't teach, they inspire. And I think the biggest thing for me is when I am assessing a difficult conversation or a particularly challenging time in my leadership, or perhaps one of the greatest accomplishments I've ever had professionally, one of my desires is with my passion, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but is to use inspiration to get others believing that they too can experience success, that they too can get through this difficult time, yeah. that they too have the ability to move in a direction that is positive in its nature. And uh, I, I think going back, Chris, to your, you asking me, okay, so what are we talking about here when, when teachers take risk, when teachers create a safe environment? So how do you create the safe yeah. environment? How do you create a place to inspire back to our thesis? And I, I, I am constantly assessing myself as a leader more on inspiration than I am on content. Now, I haven't forgotten, those of you that have been following John for years as I have, I have not forgotten the difference between a motivational teacher yeah. and a motivational speaker. That's right. We know this. A motivational teacher takes something comp uh, simple and makes it complicated, yeah. right? Sorry for all you teachers out there. A motivational teacher, speaker rather, actually takes things that are complicated mm. and makes it simple. That's good. And so what you and I need to realize as leaders and all of our podcast listeners is we have a responsibility to create the environment for which we want to teach or for which we want to take people on a journey with us. I was reminded, I was talking about this before as we just kind of put some prep thoughts together. I was reminded of a, of a, a complete leadership colossal mess up that I had recently. I mean, just absolutely. It dotted the I <laughs> on everything a leader could do to mess up. Now, I have to tell you in podcast land that Jake, our, our producer, and uh, Jared, our, our content vice president here in the um, – both of them are in the studio, and they keep cautioning me not to keep being vulnerable. They say I've been too vulnerable lately. They don't like vulnerability. They like polish and faking things out, and I'm just kidding. I'm giving them a hard time because they said they, – we were talking about something else, and they did that. But I'm getting ready to be vulnerable with you again, okay? So, Jake, Jared, shut your ears. Okay. <laughs> I'm in this meeting. I've got brand new team members. In fact, the meeting, we're merging two companies. The meeting was literally half and half. Existing people that have worked with me for years and people that this was literally their first meeting ever with me. Okay, get the picture. I've got people that know me at the heart level. They have watched me stumble and fumble and mess up hundreds of times and come back and be authentic like I'm trying to be now. And then we have other people that the jury is out if this redheaded guy is going <laughs> to even be worth listening to, much less following. In this meeting, I had an individual that is working that I'm working with to develop their leadership acumen. There, there's a there's a passion that they have to lead at this level and a realization that they've got a, a, a gap to mm. close. So we're working on it. And I'm doing this and, and I'm pulling no punches. Sometimes I go, hey, that's that was a really bad move. And then I move on, trusting the relational equity that yeah, we have. That okay. Have, yeah. This particular leader decided in the middle of a very important meeting to go off point with my agenda, just completely off point. No harm, no foul. That happens hundreds of times. Chris, you probably in that yeah. same meeting did it, but I'm not working with you the same level I, or for the same reason. Right, right. In this moment, I realized that they had created a challenge for something that I had been working with them one-on-one, -on -one, and I decided to highlight it in front of everybody, the infraction they made to leadership awareness. Now, was I right? Yes, the leadership awareness was not there. I was trying to take the, or the meeting here. They went there, and they did it publicly. And I could have handled it 53 different ways. The way I chose to handle it was call them out in front of everybody. <laughs> their people, yeah. new people. Yeah. It, this is a very prominent person yeah. that, that was a champion for me in this room that I completely embarrassed. Now, let's go back to what John says. 
We never learn from that which embarrasses us. Number one, I devalued another right. human being. That's right. Let's just call a party foul there right. against our very values. Number two, if that if my mental thought at that moment was to teach them how off that was, I can never teach somebody from a place of embarrassment. Mm-hmm. And as a leader, we've got to always make sure that there are some lessons that need to be learned one-on-one and very few lessons that need to be learned by one in front of many That's good. because it creates an embarrassing situation and no lesson is transferred in an embarrassing situation. Yeah, I I um, am smiling not because uh, the situation was not serious because it is. I'm smiling because, man, I, f- I found myself there before. And, and the, the way that we can immediately disconnect with our people, John talks about connecting with our people to, to be able to teach them to facilitate kind of – is to embarrass them. You want you want to disconnect with a, someone on your team, then go ahead and embarrass them. That's exactly right. And, and I'll tell you this: I have a tendency at times, and uh, I, Joel Manby kind of hits this. You know, one of our incredible thought leaders talks about it a lot. Never, ever, ever is there a reason to make a joke in a meeting in a group setting at someone else's expense, even if you're not making a point. Because what does that do? That draws attention to him and embarrasses him. And um, you know, so man, that's such a good point when. You were facilitating content. You were teaching. You were opening up the room for a certain situation, and and it happened. Um, but what I love about it that you didn't share was immediately after the meeting. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, absolutely. And that and 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 that's okay, right? Like um, that you did that. That is awesome to be able to go first, just like I talked yeah. about. So you made that mistake. One of the things that I think about is um, because we've been around facilitation of content for so long, is that. There are tips, there are techniques, there are different personalities that are going to be in a room. You knew his personality, yeah. and it didn't surprise you, matter of fact. You just reacted. I did. Uh, you weren't surprised by it, um, but you reacted. And so one of the things that that we've done in helping leaders um, with content, um, but more importantly is to facilitate it, is to make sure you're aware of what are the competencies to facilitate a great mm-hmm. meeting, great content. What What are some of the tips to stay away from what are some of the techniques to open up the room? All those things we've just been blessed right. to be around for so many, um, so many years of content. Seeing John do it and our facilitators, and so we we work through that. And we talked about this on part one. We did. We want you to go back and listen to it. <clears throat> if you didn't listen to it, we talked about Mark's vision, John's vision, starting uh, a facilitator program for those that are in communities and are leaders inside organizations that want to add value. And if that's you, maybe you don't have time to go listen to session one. We won't be offended, but I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to go to maxwellpodcast.com slash facilitator, fill out the form there, and we'll love to share more information with you. But I only share that right there because one of the lessons that we've taught, Perry Holly and I, on video was how to make sure you create a safe environment so that everybody, your goal is to bring the brilliance out in the room. Right. And that's what you were trying to do. Yep. And you may have stifled it for a little bit right there because of that comment. And we all fall into that. And we want to be able to help you with that if you're listening to us. Yeah, you know, um, it, for all of us that really want to better our environments and improve people along the way, as well as grow our influence, there is an art to creating to creating safe environments, yeah. to facilitating, to use your word. There is an art to that. I, I think back, and, and this is one of the things that we teach in this program. I'm so glad that you re-mentioned that last, uh, this week, what we talked about last week. But um, there is an art that I've watched John do that he people think that he's on stage speaking to 10,000 people, 5,000 people, 250 people. He is really facilitating a safe environment to where more people at different levels of leadership can listen to a Maxwell lesson and apply it to their level than any other communicator out there. Yeah. You know why? It creates a safe environment. Yeah. It's okay to feel the weight of the world with multi-million dollar companies on my shoulder, and it's okay to be an entry-level telesales representative like I was at the beginning. Both can listen to a lesson and begin that leadership journey because John just really, truly creates the safe environment. I want to bring up a point that um, you just brought back to, to my memory. So you and I had the privilege of uh, being at one of our favorite events every year in exchange uh, just a couple months ago. And you and I were in a meeting uh, prior to that, and we had planned 
an activity that a lot of people had a lot of angst about. Yep. And and maybe even embarrassed to say, I don't want to do that. I'm I'm fearful of what 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 could come of that. I'm all these questions that they would have been embarrassed about. And um, so you and John helped coach me through how to how to create a safe environment uh, as we opened up the day and the and the meeting. And so I'll never forget this recap that I had with John. You were not there yet. You were coming in later that evening. And so I talked to John after I had had that meeting and, and used some of your, your coaching and John's coaching on what to communicate to create this safe environment. And he said something to me, he gave me a lot of great compliments, but he said, I asked him, I said, what is one thing you would have done differently? And he said, mm, that's a good question. He said, what I would have done was I would have just said, you know what? I feel that way too. Hey, I've been concerned about admitting that maybe I am a little uh, fearful of this activity or, and just to be able to kind of sit back in it with them that way they don't feel embarrassed for admitting. Cause he said, what do they do? As soon as you go, Hey, I was a little, I was a little concerned about this. They all go, Oh yeah, me too. And they're not, they're not embarrassed to be able to do that. And he just has, you're, you're so right. He has so many techniques and tips that he uses to create, not just when he's leading our, our team, because he facilitates conversation, best ideas win, all that stuff. Yeah. But when he is talking to a crowd, and I, I wasn't necessarily um, 200 people in the room, I wasn't asking to facilitate a conversation, but he was helping me understand sure. how he facilitates that conversation to create a safe environment. Well, and just to put a loop on that, it was an experience with the Navy SEALs, yeah, yeah. special ops of the military, and it was an exercise early morning on the beach in San Diego in what was the coldest day of 2022. Yes, so bad. There were every dynamic that, that we gave, and Chris, the way that you did create a safe environment, number one, 100 percent of the 150 people showed up to be in that environment. And I'd already had phone calls for weeks saying, I'm not going to show up that. I'm not going to show up that. You created an environment to where everybody showed up. Not only that, everyone had a takeaway and everybody considered that one of their top experiences of a three-day event mm -hmm. because we intentionally created a safe environment yeah. for that. I, that's a brilliant illustration under this point yeah. that you can make the most audacious challenge, the challenge that people that had been coming to exchange for years was dreading this more than anything I'd ever heard in feedback. Yeah, yeah. And yet we created very, with great intentionality an environment to where people felt safe enough to Take a risk, yeah. And loved it. Yeah, take a risk, and then they ended up learning something from it. So it just came to mind when you were yeah, saying that. I wanted to share it with our with our audience. All right, let's move on to what could be our, um, well, our most passionate discussion yes. in regards yes. to when you and I are having this conversation. So John talks about in point four that um, you have to exude passion as well as purpose. We talked about you got to do it in a way of being very authentic to how you're wired um, and yet at the same point in time, you got to manage that a little bit because some of us may come across with a little bit of uh, too much passion. Talk about when you hear John teach this principle, uh, you teach with passion. It's in you, right? And I think it's in you because you're a product of the product you believe. John talks about it here in these last four points of point number four. Everything there aligns directly with where you're at as a leader. Talk a little bit about how you manage that passion of yours when you're teaching and facilitating content with people in our teams? Well, number one, let me let me say this. You asked what did I think or how did I feel when John was teaching that? I went, yes, <laughs> yeah, touchdown. That's right. In fact, I thought about three recent occasions that John has told me to modify my tempo and emotion from stage to be a little bit more effective. And I thought about capturing my notes for all of you on um, – on watching on YouTube, I print out the notes at the bonus resource section as well. And and so I thought I've circled it because I've got to go show John that I still can be passionate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I, so number one, the first thing I did was like, yes, it's yeah. it's my best birthday yeah. present ever. <laughs> but um I'll I'll tell you this. Um I still stand by what I told you right before we started recording after we listened to John. As a highly passionate person, you do the values card yeah. exercise with yeah. clients all over. When I did that, one of my top five values is passion. Growth is another one. Passion is everything to me. Mm -hmm. If I can't get excited about it, nobody wants to be around me. Trust me, I'm a boring person. But if I can get excited about what I'm doing, it just it, it overcomes me. 
Well, what that means is, is when I'm passionate about something that we need to do and we're not measuring up, we're coming up short. Something happens. Something's a distraction. My passion is portrayed as intensity. Yeah. And it's it, I, we had Liz Wiseman on here this year, and um, Liz talks about the book in the book Maximizer about a passion that can also be a minimize or a, a maximizer strength can be a minimizer uh, liability. And that's certainly true for me under passion. I mean, I've had people that worked alongside me. Nobody works for me, but worked alongside me for 10 years, 15 years, that I'll get passionate about something. It comes across to them as intensity, and they'll go, is something wrong with me? Are you mm. mad at me? Is something wrong? I'm going, have we not worked long enough together that you know I would tell you if I'm displeased, if I'm, not, if I'm frustrated? No, I got to get there. Even those closest to you can misread passion if you're not aware of your audience. That's why John says great teachers exude passion as well as That's purpose. Right. And there's sometimes that I really am frustrated with where we are because my passion is so strong. If I don't give purpose to the frustration, if I don't slow down and give context to why my frustration is there, it will be it will be received as displeasure, as demeaning, as unhappy, as you name it, terminal, negative, yeah. It, yeah, everything yeah. that you can imagine. If I don't slow down and couple my passion with purpose, so when I am frustrated. I always tell myself, Mark, give context on why this is frustrating. It's slower for some. I've seen some people go, oh, my gosh, can you get to the point? I already know there's some, there's a hammer coming, but can you get to the point? And I always have to discipline myself. Yeah. Slow your passion down in moments of frustration or shortfall and give context before you emulate passion because it will be taken as intensity. I love my passion. I wouldn't trade anything for it. I love it. I love growth. That's another high value of mine. I wouldn't trade those things. They are the things that make me unique. Mm -hmm. But being wise with those are a difference maker in the two points today. Point number one, create a safe environment. Yeah. Point number two, do it with purpose. Don't just be passionate with purpose without purpose because then you're just a fanatic. And we all know what fans are, right? They're fanatics with no sense of reality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and so I don't want to have no sense of reality in the things that I am, I am passionate about because then I become a fanatic. Yeah. I think um, – and I, I knew exactly almost every word that you were going to just – we've worked together for a long yeah. time. And I think there's also the other side of that. As we're kind of wrapping up, I want to talk about the other side of it because mm -hmm. people hear about your passion all the time. And one of the things that we're learning in, in organizational development and the companies we're working with is that one of the top, probably top four reasons people stay at organizations or join organizations is because there's meaningful work, right? Yeah. And with that is the purpose side of things. And so what I want to just challenge our listeners or our viewers that are joining us today is that maybe you feel like you're not as passionate. Um, that would be me, right? I communicate in a different way. I don't have as much passion as Mark does, but the purpose, we are directly aligned in the purpose of what yeah. we do. So at times I've got to recognize that and I have to ramp up my passion um, so that it communicates everything that John talks about here in these four points at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? Do I believe it? 100%. Has it changed me? Yes. Do I believe it will change others? Absolutely. And have I seen it change others every single day in what we get to yeah. do? And if that's the case, then I've got to, maybe I got to up my passion a little bit so that it aligns with how big the purpose is. And oh, by the way, we want our team or those that were facilitating content or uh, leading teaching, we want them to buy in and understand we have meaningful work. It's got to come from us. And so there's an other side of that that I just wanted to share with you yeah. in regards to that, because you're always very vulnerable and sharing kind of where you're at. But also there's another side to that, and I want our listeners to be aware of that because you have to manage that. It's got to be a balance. You do. It's why, it's why charismatic leaders, we've heard of the charisma of a yeah, leader. The yeah. charismatic leader draws people in and challenges them and inspires them, and they get to moving. And, and you've got to have the purpose behind the charisma. But let me tell you this. You've got to have charisma behind the purpose too, which is what you're saying. Yes. And yes. so a great charismatic leader a lot of times fizzles out. 
because they're just up for the hype. They're just up for the moment. They're just up for the, the, the excitement. And then the purpose does not sustain them beyond the, the inspiration. It doesn't sustain them through a change, right. through something right. difficult. Right. Yet at the same time, I'm glad you brought this up. I've seen a lot of people with great purpose not able to mobilize anybody. Because they can't find within them the charisma, the passion, the ability to draw people in to their purpose. And I would challenge you, I would challenge all of our podcast listeners to not call passion a personality trait. Mm. Don't say, I'm introverted, I don't show my passion. No, that's an excuse. Because you are passionate. Just maybe you're passionate about your alone time. Maybe maybe you're passionate about just having some me time with your family and or not even with your family. You get passionate. Find within you, and John's given us great places to find the process of building fire and building passion. You said it, but let me say it again. Do I believe it? Is it core to who I am? Has it changed me? Truly has it changed mm. you? And don't just answer that with a quick check. How? How did it change you? Because when you find the how it changed you, you'll find the way to passionately communicate the impact of it. So I love this question. I'm not taking away from John at all. Has it changed you? But go just one step further. That's good. How? And when you realize that how, oh, now I can stand in front of people and talk about how Mm. this has made a difference in my life. Um, Do I believe it will change others? Was it just a personal thing? Or were you giving this opportunity or this change for the benefit of others? And then finally, have I seen it change others? And when I can, mm. when I can see the multiplier effect of change that happened in my life first and then others, it truly is fuel to me. I'm ready to go challenge some of the people with it. What I love about this and what you were just talking about is when you go through and really answer these four questions, and to your point, go deep on each one of the questions – out of that is going to come the authentic reason mm-hmm. and your authentic passion and your authentic purpose. All, all the Because if you dig into these, it's going to give you real life examples. I'll throw it back to you to let you close up. I Well, there's one quote I want to share. The, you know, this two-part lesson that Mark and I um, covered for you, great leaders are great teachers. What a great lesson it was mm. from John. And I, I saw this quote that I just want to share as we kind of wrap up and throw it back to you. It was by Jack Welch. And he said, as a leader, you have to have a teachable point of view. Mm. You have to have one. So we're talking about passion. Yeah. What a great quote to kind of wrap up with saying, you've got to have a point of view. You have to have something you're willing to come and teach. And when you do that, all four points that John gave us over these these two lessons will absolutely just come out of you. They'll live out authentically as you lead your team or communicate to your team. Yeah, you know, we talked about uh, this on both lessons, and I'm going to bring it back up here because I'll put it in the show notes. But um, it, we talked about this idea of facilitating, mm. of really, and I know it's great leaders are great teachers, but it could have been great leaders are great facilitators sure. because so much of what we do is visible. It, it, or excuse me, so much of the change that we have in others is a visual implication or a vis- visual um, opportunity for people to mm-hmm. see that change. And so um, for all of us that are wanting to better our game, better our leadership game, better our teaching game, better our facilitating lane, get into a community, get into a yeah. disciplined approach. And as we kind of launch into 2023, my challenge to all of us, is to learn to be a better teacher. Now, you can call that a coach. You can call that a communicator. You can call that a facilitator. facilitator yeah. But be a better demonstrator of what that's great. works. That's great. And that's the challenge. Well, today's topic is how leaders move from good to great. Mm-hmm. And there's a book, you know, about good to great. We're going to talk today a little bit about how do leaders do that? How are you, know, are you a good leader? Are you a great leader? How do you move the needle to become a great leader? There's so many factors that really distinguish a good leader from a great leader. And and some of the research that we've done and and Perry's looked at uh, by Jack Zenger and and Joe Folkman, some of the factors are improve communication effectiveness, encourage others. We we talk about that on here to grow and to improve, be a role model, uh, be a champion for your team recognize when change is needed. 
Otherwise, you'll become irrelevant. And then finally, the last one we have on here is improve, improve your ability to inspire and motivate those that are in your influence. Lots of good stuff. And um, Dr. Zanger and Dr. Folkman doing this research, what they did was they took 360-degree feedback data uh, and looked at uh, the critical skills of leaders who were progressing uh, most in their leadership, and they pulled these uh, these topics out. The one that I thought and that's so key to what we talk about anyway that I thought we should uh, maybe go a little deep on today was about um, – about lead, you know uh, communication effectiveness. Um, I think how you communicate really mm. affects your reputation as yeah. a leader. And I wanted to get today. I want to get practical. I love it. So I'm gonna we'll talk about some of the concepts, but how do we actually get practical about that? And I'd like you to walk away from this uh, time you invest with other day to one or three things that you can work on between now and uh, with working with your team. So that's is that okay excellent. with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love that. So the first way to increase communication. Effectiveness, effectiveness is to become a better listener. Okay, hang on a minute. <laughs> I just heard was that, was that were those radios clicking off. And <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's no, right. No one think, wants to do that. I know. No, they all no, think they're, I'm a great listener. Yeah. What, are you kidding me? Yeah. I'm a fantastic listener. As my wife says all the time, right? I know you hear me. <laughs> You're just not listening to me. <laughs> so uh, I think that there is room for all of us. And what's really key about this is that we often ask a question in some of our training and we say we play this would you rather you know game in essence uh what's more important to be a better uh, communicator or, or an effective listener and and then we challenge them we say well whichever one you pick right you have to pick this or that um you you can't use the other word as you're describing you know why you picked the answer that you did and it's always fun because especially when you get to this one and you talk about communication and, and everybody's right it's a trick question they go well i can't do that because they're one and the same. They, that, you know, listening is part of communication and they're spot on and we do it and we have fun with it. And we talk about how, you know, really there's a two way pathway in regards to communication. And that, that second pathway is to really become a better listener. You can be a great communicator, but if you're not listening to what you need to communicate, then, then it's going to be, it's not gonna be very effective or vice versa. You can be a great listener, but if you're not, you don't have the ability to communicate. And so I love that we're going to dive into this and really unpack how do we incre increase our communication effectiveness. And the first one is to become a better listener. Well, I find that listening is the number one way to show you value someone. Mm. Uh, you're giving something you can't get back, which is time uh, to do that. I think when a leader invests time in uh, actively listening to their people, that it, it, it uh, demonstrates respect. It um, you begin to understand team members' points of view. You begin to understand how they think. Uh, I just think that when you begin to truly appreciate a team member's perspective, uh, you do that through, uh, yeah, I mean, you can add so much to your own thinking by just listening and asking good questions and listening actively to what your team members are telling yeah. you. So um, most people think they're better listeners than they really are, as we were joking about a minute ago. Uh, so I really wanted to get practical about are there some things – even if you think you're okay listening, do you think you could get better? I know yeah. I could. Yeah. And so what are some of those ideas? And I thought we could bat that about. I, I think that when you become intentional about improving your listening skills, um, it will absolutely increase your connection with people, your influence with people. Uh, we we joke all the time about our spouses who um, are our only two listeners <clears throat> to the podcast <laughs> about how you and I could do a much better job uh, of listening. And I think it's something that if we all slowed down and we remove distractions, we could all get better at, but man, we live in a time and a pace where things are moving faster than they've ever moved before. Social media and devices are everywhere. And, and it's a, it's a problem. I even think about the fact that um, I have a couple of nephews that are, are staying with us this week and we love it. We have fun with them. And, and so I begin to watch the, the difference in generations and the influences mm -hmm. that are in their life take away from their ability to listen. Um, and so, man, I think this is going to be something as we move forward in organizations that we need to continue to focus on. And so here are a couple of things uh, practically to really look at. We're just talking about electronic devices, put your phone away when you're having a conversation mm -hmm. with somebody there's nothing worse than having a, a conversation with somebody and their phone is right there and they keep glancing at their phone and it's buzzing and keep going off. Man, if it's gonna, if it's gonna be doing that, it's not a problem. 
just try to put that away. Re, uh, remain in eye contact with the individual. Mm-hmm. Have that connection with them while you're listening. Um, give them your complete attention. I'll never forget when I was much younger, someone said the greatest thing that you could do is when you're listening to somebody is for them to think, holy cow, there's a lot of stuff going on right now and it seems like nothing else matters but our conversation because you're giving them complete attention. And then don't interrupt them. Oh man, this like this is one of the things that just bothers me um, is that when I am speaking um, or I am watching a conversation and somebody just keeps interrupting a conversation, allow them to finish that. And then finally, take notes from what you're hearing from them. I'll never forget, I was... I was at a, an event one time and John uh, was speaking. And so we were there as a client of ours and it's a, a CEO of a, of, a, of a very large company. And John was interviewing this CEO on leadership up on stage. And uh, John was asking the questions and then just feverishly taking notes, listening intently, but taking notes. And so we we're on the ride home, we, you know, to the airport. And, and I said, John, talk to me a little bit. I haven't seen you do that before. Talk to me a little bit about what was behind you taking notes and uh, and during that interview. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm working right now on becoming a better listener. I'm looking at becoming better engaged. And when I find myself having to think about what they're saying to be able to take notes, um, it makes me listen better. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And so taking notes allows you to do that. The other thing that I think is key here is that, yes, this will help you from uh, from a communication standpoint. But this, all of these things that we have laid out here, they're going to add value to the person that's talking to you. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're going to think, man, I'm important. Uh, I'm engaged in this conversation. So just some practical ways to do that to improve your listening. I listen to you talk about, yeah, put my phone away, but you also need to master your wrist. I am so tired oh, of people. Oh, that's so good. While I'm talking to someone, they look <laughs> at their watch, but they're not checking the time, although they may be, and that, yeah. which, which sends me a very bad message. Yeah. But it may be worse. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't have to pull out my phone. Oh. I can just look at my wrist because that's where all my. Oh no, don't do that. And I was also so the, the the skill the skill of curiosity is mm. one that many leaders need to work on. Is that when someone's talking to me, can I become curious about? What are they, I'm curious. What is the point they're trying to make? I'm curious. How does this apply to what we're talking about? I'm curious. And it just makes me a little bit deeper in my thinking and listening. Uh, and then also, uh, I got some coaching on this was I'm trying to formulate instead of my response to what you're saying, I'm trying to formulate what's the best question I can ask when you're done. And thought, before I give my mm-hmm. response, I need to ask one question. It, it, it could be a follow up. It could be something. But it, can I? Can I? Uh, I also like little phrases uh, that help me. Uh, I use uh, "Tell me more." Uh, what happened next? And then what did you do? And most people are f- just floored that you would encourage them to keep talking because most they're they're used to waiting people waiting for them to take a breath so they could jump in and talk. And instead, I said, "Well, tell me more. Yeah. What happened next?" I also hear you say quite a bit lately which i love which is i i have a point of view on that <laughs> what's your point of view yeah, i love that right yeah, and i yeah. love that i love how you yeah. position that so that they can you can continue to listen more to what they're doing another way uh improving communication effectiveness uh, and raise your leadership influence become intentional about your non-verbals um, like body language uh, facial expression tone of voice um, all the ways that uh, people are reading <laughs> you as they're communicating um, you know, we talk about you're always making people feel something. What is it you make people feel? So when you're someone's talking to you or when you're talking to someone, let's, let's keep it on listening. Someone's talking to you. What are you doing with your face? What yeah. are you doing with your, your body language? Are you facing them? Are you facing the door? Are you, you know, rolling your eyes? Are you get your hands on your hips? You're, what? Th- there's positive and negatives about all that, but I think it really affects so much about how people feel. Are they being heard mm. or... Are they? Are you just tolerating and waiting for your time to speak? Yeah, this is uh, so good for me personally just to even go through this because I'll get lazy at times listening, and I know this, uh, but maybe my actions don't necessarily show that. And so, again, we're in the leadership space. This is what we do every day. Uh, we're in the communication space, and yet you're you're challenging me with some of the things that we're talking about here today. And so as you're listening to this podcast, I hope that you're being challenged as well to become a, a better listener. One other thing in regards to this is, do you have empathetic communication style? Mm-hmm. 
you guys know what I'm talking about. There are those that do and those that don't when it comes across that way. And and empathy in your communication means that you're you you have the ability and you can relate to the individual and maybe not exactly what they're going through, right? Uh, but you can get into that place with them and you can be empathetic during a conversation. And when you do this, it no doubt increases your ability to connect with people and then will increase your influence as a, a leader. Um, when you were just talking about mind your mind your face, I love it when you say that, right? Like what what is that what is that what is that face telling people? Yeah. I was having this conversation just recently within the last week with a leader and we were talking about as conversations happen, um, the facial expressions will change. And um, somebody said to this individual, like, what, what's going on with the face? Like, and, and, he, and he said back to, we've, we've, we've worked together for how long? Like, you know, this is just. And so they kind of started laughing about it. And then he said, oh, let me tell you another funny story about kind of the mind your face as you're talking about this and, and listening. He said that some of his team want the masks to be a policy of uh, what they have to wear while they're working because it covers his face and they don't have to look at his oh facial expressions gosh. while he's listening or communicating to the team. That's the power of what you're talking about here in connecting through communication um, and whether you have empathy or, or not is, you know, is mind your face. Do you smile? Do you welcome people? Are you approachable? Or are you not? Yeah. Empathy versus sympathy. <laughs> yeah. oh, can I feel for you or do I feel sorry for you? Uh, that people can tell if you're relating to them. Uh, another great way to improve, uh, improve your communication effectiveness was to uh, master this skill. I call it a skill mm -hmm. of providing regular feedback to those you work with. And uh, when you provide constructive feedback, uh, you communicate that you care about me, that uh, you you want to see me grow and improve. And I think, uh, unfortunately, many leaders shy away from this because they fear the conflict it might cause. They don't want to give bad news. Mm. I don't know what the, I've heard many reasons for this, but uh, done correctly, I believe that feedback uh, can be your friend is a great way to really find the greatness in other people. And so when you say my communication style, if, if you expect that when you're with me and we're we're performing in our role, that I'm going to give you feedback and that I expect feedback from you. Do do you think that makes mm. my, raises my reputation as a leader? I think so. I think yeah. people turn to expect say, Perry, what do you think? And that's what I'll use. So well, I have a point of view, but what do you think? Because yeah. yeah. uh, I want to hear what they think first. But get practical on that one. I love know, that. Feedback. So let's talk about this feedback. We've all heard of the feedback sandwich, right? Like and and. The reason that we really do it, and this is this is so good, is that we really do that because it makes us feel better about giving the <laughs> that's feedback. What, that's what I've learned. Yes, <laughs> um, they know what you're doing, by the way, right? Yeah, yeah. And and so they probably have their guard up even more, and they're not even listening. And explain to the, the feedback sandwich. Just... So where you end up giving somebody something mm -hmm. positive, then some constructive feedback, and then you close with a positive comment, and we can get out as quickly as possible. And then you I, get out <laughs> as quickly as possible. Now yeah. I feel better about myself. Yeah, that's right. And so. Man, I, I, I gave him two positive things, one negative. And so to your point uh, here is that, man, yeah, absolutely. I think that that is more for you than them. So I've heard you teach and talk about um, getting away from the feedback sandwich and talking more about a feedback conversation. That's right, right. And the feedback conversation goes like this. As close to an event that you've witnessed as possible as a leader, share something that you thought the person did well then share something you think they might have done better, and then ask the question, which you were just talking about a minute ago, which is, what did you think about that? Mm -hmm. So you're you're creating this dialogue versus giving statements on that that sandwich, and you're inviting them to have a conversation, and that is a much different approach to a topic than just having the feedback sandwich. Oh, it's worked amazing for me. Is that, um, hey, that sales call? I thought you did a great job on engaging the client the prospect in a conversation. One area I thought you could have improved on with how you presented our value proposition. What do you think? And the salesman looks right at me and says, no, I thought it was great. What are you kidding me? I go, well, I really, I thought some confusion on the customer's face mm -hmm. and I was just observing, but maybe I'm wrong. How did you see it? And he goes, well, now that you mentioned it, I did get a little tangled up and I, I was very vague on a couple of things and I really wasn't sure how to, I said, well, tell, tell me, how can we, uh, 
how can we have done it differently? And now we're in a beautiful place. I'm having That's a great, great conversation. And they actually, the salesman, what salesman ever did this? Is says, hey, would you do a role play with me on that? Nobody ever asked Nobody. for a role play. Yeah. I thought, yeah, let's, let's role play that for a moment. How could, give me the value prop <laughs> to, to do that. So um, another area I think can improve your reputation as a leader and your, increase your influence and increase your communication is, and we talk about it a lot here, but I think it really applies is those three questions that mm -hmm. every follower, every uh, person you're listening to is asking about you while you're leading, while you're influencing them. Do you remember the three questions? No. Okay. I'm not listening. <laughs> you do. I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. So what they want to know is, hey, are you going to help them? Yeah. Um, do you care about them? Yep. And can they trust you? Yeah, love these. And this is a staple of, of John and, and really what, when he talks about leadership and connecting with people. And so these are a great way to frame your question. Now, what we want you to know is, man, if, you're, if you can answer yes, or these questions are being answered yes about your leadership, then your communication is in a pretty good place. And, and you have the ability to in, increase your influence and your reputation as a leader. The, the, the getting practical behind this and why we put this in here is if the answer to any of those three questions is no, then dig into that. Why is it no? Why is it, why is it that um, it is no? What, what can you be doing or working on to move that from a no to a yes? They're simple questions, and it's a simple answer, yes or no. If it's yes, hey, keep trudging, keep getting better. But if it's no, we really want you to kind of unpack and look into that. Yeah, fantastic. And and then finally, I, I just thought that, you know, John's new book out on mm. the 16 Undeniable Laws of Communication, I was really taken uh, by a truth uh, in one of the laws there was that uh, the, the law of credibility that, you know, great communicator knows that you're not the main attraction. It's the, all your communication is about others. And if you make it about yourself, you, if you're talking in a way that um, makes it about you, you're not making it meaningful for others. So I thought for me, that was a great reminder is that in my communication, is it about others? Am I talking to other? Am I, am I listening with respect to others? Uh, lots of things that make up a great communicator, but being credible in your communication mm -hmm. um, by the life you live and the way that you present yourself, and then you make it about others goes a long way. Goes a long way. Well, as we wrap up, Remember, we started this by talking about how leaders move from good leadership to great leadership. And I love that you said, hey, let's just take one and let's get really practical. What's interesting is that one, when we work with organizations, we go through a discovery process and no doubt about it, the top in the top three every time, and you know this, mm -hmm. you've been on a lot of discovery calls, is man, listen, we got to get better at communication as leaders. We have leaders that don't do a good job of communicating as an organization. We don't do a good job of communicating. So here were just a couple of very practical, simple ways. Go back, listen, have a little bit of an assessment, check yourself on these areas that we brought to you. And I promise you, if you work on becoming a, a more effective communicator by some of the tips that we get, that, that we gave you, you will go from being a good leader to a great leader. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results.